Hi, for today's video, I invited a designer called Vukashin uh, Nishavich to talk about his latest game currently on Kickstarter, Freezing Inferno. This game covers the 39-40-1940 uh, conflict between the USSR and Finland. I'm Fred Serval, and you're watching Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. Hi, Vukashin. Thanks for being here today. How were things? Yeah. Hello, Fred. Thank you for inviting me. I'm fine. Things are going, doing good. Uh, our campaign is currently live and uh, we're happy that uh, we can talk with you on your show. Yeah, I'm very happy to, to, to have you here on the show because I've, as I've said multiple times, uh, I'm also trying to show that the, the world of wargaming is bigger than just in the United States, uh, that there is a wargaming from everywhere in the world. So each time I can give uh, some visibility from people outside of the US, I'm also happy to do so. And, and especially like uh, you're not necessarily coming from a, a country that is known for, for wargaming. Uh, could you tell our viewers where, where you're from? I'm from Serbia. It's uh, for those who don't know, it's in Europe on the Balkan Peninsula. <clears throat> and uh, we play war games here too. Yeah. Do you have a big war game community in Serbia? Um, I, can't, I couldn't say it's a big war game community, but board game, yes, we have a board game community, which is pretty, pretty big here. There are a lot of uh, studios making their own games and a lot of board game studios uh, where people can come and play. Uh, but as for uh, war game itself, I think it's a little bit smaller than I would like to be. I guess that's something that you also, if you want this to grow, it's also the, um, that, that's usually what I say, it's also the, the war gamers themselves that have to, to start um, uh, organize and start to convert people from the board gaming community. You usually have a good pull from, from there. You see that there is a potential uh, progress for, for building a war game community in, uh, in Serbia. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, that is one of the reasons why I uh, designed this game in, in, in this way. Uh, the game is uh, pretty much like an intro to the war game world. Uh, so a uh, board gamer who is interested in war game will not be intimidated by a lot of counters and uh, long hours of playing. This game offers uh, a balance between uh, uh, serious war gaming and a uh, hobby gaming so uh, it's a good way to introduce uh, new people to war gaming and uh, to bring new people to the hobby so you almost designed this this game as a tool for yourself to to get people into war gaming is yes. that yes that, yes that's, uh, that's a good that's, way to that's a good way to approach it uh, but I, I, I was curious maybe to talk about yourself first before talking about uh, freezing inferno yeah, no and i was i was wondering um what when did you start playing uh, playing board games? Well, I started like when I was very young. Uh, I think uh, uh, Risk was my first uh, uh, board game that we played when we were in elementary school. And uh, my friends loved it. I loved it. And since then, uh, I've been trying to, to develop some sort of uh, upgrade on that game. And uh, as I grew up, uh, I got, got more serious uh, thinking about it. And at the end, uh, uh, I finished uh, creating my first war game. Uh, it's called uh, March on the Drina. Uh, it's a World War I war game uh, covering uh, uh, Balkan Peninsula theater in uh, during 1914-1918 world conflict. It started uh, somewhere be uh, one year before the 100th anniversary of World War I. I thought it would be a good idea to make a game about... Uh, uh, Serbia's uh, role in that uh, in that war, and uh, the thing just uh, took off, and uh, we decided to do a Kickstarter. We succeeded. Then we just start to move along and uh, create new war games. And already, this game was was pretty uh, lightweight. Uh, uh, March on the Drina. It was a game that was uh, supposed to be for like not heavy war gamers, like it, you already designed it with the intent of it very, being very accessible. Yes, uh, yes. Very, very simple. Uh, just like a, a beginner's level uh, war game. Uh, you just uh, didn't, uh, I didn't, didn't want to bother players, new players with uh, a lot of details they need to uh, take care of uh, so they could just enjoy the game. So it was very, very uh, uh, light detailed game. 
the terrain has no effect, uh, the, there's no weather. So just like a basic mechanics, which, uh, which pretty much uh, uh, was what I was aiming for. So people can just uh, think about the tactics and strategy and not worry about other things until they get familiar with the system and uh, get to, to love it. And then they will play something a little bit more complex, which is a Freezing Inferno. And after that, they can do a lot heavier games. And I would like to talk maybe a bit about the, the system, March on the, uh, on the Drina. I've, I haven't played it, but I've seen some picture of it. And I was all like, I remember a couple of years ago, I stumbled across it on PGG and I was really <laughs> struck by the, by the way it looked uh, because it has those standees that looked a bit like Stratego and it was really looking super compelling. I was just wondering, can you, Tell me a bit more about what's the system like. I was really curious about, about how it plays. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I wanted to make a, a, a unique system. I created a game that it's a hex-based uh, map. Uh, only one unit can stand on one hex, and uh, only one unit can attack in an, one enemy unit. So uh, there is no uh, group attack uh, at, at the same point, but you can have a subsequent uh, attacks, so uh, it uh, brings to the uh, pretty much. It, it's important to make uh, the good order of units which will attack enemy units. So it's like in uh, in real uh, situation, in real war, uh, you first do artillery shelling. After that, you send your cavalry. Uh, as for the World War One, uh, and uh, if the enemy is still standing, then you send your infantry. So the, the order of uh, units which will create an attack to an enemy, enemy unit is uh, very important. So you, ha you have to take care of, uh, uh, of, of you have to know uh, what unit you, you want to destroy and uh, what is the best way to do it to maximize their casualties and to minimize your casualties. You have some uh, pretty thinking to do uh, because there's like uh, maybe 10, 15 units on the board for, uh, for a Serbian player and you have a total of uh, 15 units for uh, the rest of the three players. So uh, having a strategy where to withdraw, where to attack, uh, is uh, pretty much uh, what the what you need to do in in that game. I was thinking about your 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 journey, and you said that you started with Risk and playing board games when you were younger, and then your first game was March on the Drina, talking about the involvement of Serbia during World War One. And I was really wondering, what's the like for you uh, as a person? What is your what do you want to achieve by making war games? Why do you want to make games about history? Why do you think it's like you want to spend so much time in actually making those games and sharing them like uh, with, with people around you? Why do you feel that's, that's important? What compels you to do something like this? Well, regarding our first war, uh, war game, uh, March on the Drina, uh, of course, uh, since it's Serbia in the center of the, of the game, uh, it was pretty much uh, important for me and uh, my wish was to... Uh, spread the word about uh, Serbia's role in World War I. Uh, that's why we created a, a calendar, which is uh, every round has its own card. And on that card, you have uh, text, uh, which uh, uh, shows the player the most important events of uh, the World War I uh, for that period. So by playing the game, players read through the text in order to get the effect of, for that round. And they learn uh, about history. So uh, we can just say that uh, the game has an educational side. And uh, the player, if the players uh, read through all the cards that are in that calendar, they will know everything they need to know about uh, World War I, and uh, especially about uh, Kingdom of Serbia role in, uh, in that conflict. And talking about war games, and even if you don't have that much time, what would you say are your favorite war games uh, overall or historical board games? Well, um, the, the, I enjoy the most uh, Axis and Allies series. Uh, I love minis, and uh, I just love the the way they look on the board. And that, that's why I, I wanted to make uh, something in between. Uh, 
hex and counters with minis. That, that, that was like my, my goal and uh, Freezing Inferno offers that option. So uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, but uh, I'd say that Axis and Allies was the, the game that got the, 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 the heaviest influence on, on, my, on my playing. And do you play any Hex and Counter games? Uh, yes, I've played uh, a couple of them. Uh, let's say Advanced Squad Leader, and uh, I tried uh, uh, the other one. Uh, not sure, I don't remember. I don't, don't remember the name now. Uh, it was in Serbian. I don't know the English. The English. Uh, I'll I'll think of it later. No okay. worries. And so you were talking already about, and we, we touched upon it a few times in some of your answers, but um, talking about Freezing Inferno, so the game that is currently on, on Kickstarter right now. This yes. game is going straight to Kickstarter. You didn't do a Serbian version first and then an, an English version. The, the game no. starts directly on Kickstarter, right? Yeah, yeah, directly on Kickstarter, right. And I was wondering maybe to, before talking about the game, if you give, could give a bit of historical context on what Freezing Inferno is depicting. Well, uh, we we wanted to uh, do a game with uh, some uh, uh, battlefield that was not uh, covered a lot in the world game world, and the Winter War uh, came up as an idea. Uh, it's a 1939-1940 conflict between Finland and the USSR, uh, and uh, those very winter conditions uh, and uh, sub <laughs> sub zero temperatures that were pretty much all the time uh, during that conflict was something that I would found interesting that I can incorporate that in the game and make uh, a little bit uh, interest, more interesting than the, than the regular game. So uh, we went for, for that uh, idea and uh, created this game. Could you tell us a bit more about how the game plays? Because uh, so I've I've seen a few uh, a few content already online. So I think that you sent also a copy to a few reviewers, like the player aids and everything. Yes. Um, so there are some contents also online. So if you want to see some images of the game, actually looks like it's going to be a really a nice production. So I recommend to to check it out. I'm curious about. Can you tell us a bit about the about the system? What's the what's the gameplay? What's the flow like? Yes, of course. The the system is based on a March on the Drina. But uh, here it comes uh, as an upgraded version. Uh, the goal game is for the Soviet player to capture two out of the three Finnish key cities, which is uh, which are uh, Helsinki, Oulu, and Petsamo. Uh, the Soviet player has a certain number of units, and the Finnish player has a certain number of units available. The players uh, have a, a secret setup at the start of the game. They have uh, sheets of minimaps, so uh, both players will uh, draw uh, their units layout on the on the mini on the minimap, and after they're finished, they just present the the layouts to the other side, and that is how they will place their unit on the board. Uh, so in that way, uh, you, the Finnish player will never know uh, from which uh, side of uh, border the Soviets will come. And uh, the Soviet players uh, can't tell where the Finnish uh, player will place its, uh, their defense. So uh, that's the one the thing that uh, uh, builds up replayability uh, for the game. Uh, in addition, you have uh, the calendar cards. Here they uh, come uh, as uh, 24 cards. You have three cards. Uh, for each round. There are uh, eight rounds in the game, and you select randomly one card for each round, uh, and you have uh, eight cards for, for the game, and uh, each card has a uh, text on it, which is some historical background, what happened in that period of the war, and the effects that is bringing the, to, the, to that round of the game. Uh, so that is also one more thing that uh, can uh, build up uh, replayability because uh, there's pretty much uh, chances that you will never have the same uh, sequence of uh, round cards selected. Uh, the system also uh, <laughs> brings uh, the weather into account. Uh, that's an optional model. You can play it without it or uh, use it. Uh, temperature and weather conditions affects uh, unit movement, affects their uh, attacking and defense capabilities. Uh, also, you will have uh, player cards 
uh, which there will there will be some uh, uh, tactical technological advancements, uh, so players can uh, build up uh, the the their units uh, or certain uh, type of units through the game and make them uh, stronger. And uh, the one thing that uh, we uh, introduced into this game is uh, you can adjust the uh, uh, impact of luck uh, in the game. Uh, the point was uh, the, the basic setup was to use a, a D8 a die to roll for uh, for the uh, for the hit, and uh, since we are using combat result table, <clears throat> there were uh, situations that uh, uh, modifiers weren't uh, enough uh, to uh, balance the the luck. Uh, on the, the balanced impact of luck uh, uh, in the game. So we created uh, two custom D20s die, uh, and uh, they are uh, reducing the impact of luck uh, in the game. So if you feel that uh, you're lucky, you will play with D8 and uh, hope you will have, uh, e you have an equal opportunity to perform br brilliantly, like to roll an eight, or uh, to fail completely, like to roll a one. Uh, but to in, in this custom uh, D20 dice, uh, those ads are uh, changed because uh, uh, even though you have 20 spaces on the die, the numbers are from 1 to 8, but in different ratio. So uh, um, it's pretty much that uh, the, the strength of the unit that are on the board will uh, decide uh, the outcome of the battle. So, so you you're... Have, you're narrowing the result of the d20 around the around the average so it's a, yes. an average yes. dice okay yes. yeah yes and that's that's really interesting so you, you you can choose as a player do you want to play with a straight d8 or if you want yes. to play with the average dice yes. oh that's that's fun it, yes. yes there was a, an old um uh there was a, an old figurine uh, war game from the from the 1980s uh, depicting uh, ancient warfare where the regulars had the regular dice could that could go from one to six and the irregulars had a, a custom dice that only had a narrower set of results uh, a bit like this to show that the results are a bit more, more predictable but also really not that great and i think it's yeah. it's it's a good it's a good it's really a good idea i really like that yeah, uh, in march the Drina, we used the we used cards for that yeah so we had like uh, cards that will bring uh, zero plus one plus two or plus three mm. Uh, you have a deck of cards, but uh, you didn't have the same amount of co each card in the deck. Um, most uh, you had like uh, eighteen cards that are plus one. You had like twelve cards that are plus two. You had six cards that are yeah. plus three or zero. So basically, uh, there are there were uh, chan most most of the time you will draw plus one. Both players will draw plus one and. So the, the uh, strength uh, ratio of the units on the board will decide the battle. Here we uh, changed that and uh, introduced dice instead of cards, uh, but we uh, wanted to do the same system, uh, so we created the custom D20s. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. And uh, I, I, was, I was wondering, so what did you want to show specifically about the, um, the event? Like, are there specific aspects of the conflict that you wanted your game to, to, to show to the players? Uh, and I heard you talking about the weather, about the secret setup. But there, are there things through the event that you wanted to show about, about, uh, about that specific war? Well, actually, we wanted to make just a, a, a game about that war. So uh, we wanted to cover like uh, uh, from the beginning to this to the start, and uh, to bring history uh, history facts uh, to the game uh, using that uh, that cards uh, that uh, that players draw uh, each round. So uh, pretty much that was like uh, the general idea. We didn't want to get uh, too specific into uh, order of battles, to scenarios, or uh, having uh, detailed uh, uh, unit names or uh, generals' uh, capabilities and everything. We just wanted to make it uh, like medium, maximum medium weight, uh, so uh, more people who are not war gamers will uh, come and play the game. And 
And I guess that my natural follow-up question is, there is one thing about lowering the complexity of the rules, but I was also wondering, did you also lower the time that it takes to, to play such a game? Because if you tell me a hex encounter game about the Winter War, my in my mind, I would expect, well, that would be at least six to seven hours, uh, something like this. Uh, yeah. I guess that's that's probably not what you went for. So I was wondering, yeah, what's, yeah, the, yeah. what's the length of the gameplay for, for well, this? Well, uh, most of the times we were able to finish the game in uh, like four to five hours. Hours. Uh, maybe sometimes it will take up to a six, but uh, you, we will talk. We were talking a lot about the rules, what we should we change or we should leave. So I think that like four hours is like something that uh, that should be a uh, minimum that will people play. And uh, if you are experienced enough, you can lower the the, the time up maybe to three hours uh, per game. Okay, so it's still a pretty involved game, so four, four or five hours. And uh, if the campaign ends well and it looks like it's going well, when do you think the game would be available for, for the backers? Well, in Kickstarter, we stated that the backers will get the game uh, by September 2023. Uh, that's like the latest date. Uh, we gave ourselves enough times, mm. enough time to do that, but uh, since we have everything ready, and uh, we have the files ready, we have the manufacturers selected, we have the publisher, our partners, uh, fulfillment companies, everything is set up. Uh, it is easier to, to imagine that the game will come maybe in late second quarter of 2023 to the backers. Okay, so the game is ready now, actually. It was just uh, you, were, you were doing the campaign to, to secure the funding to launch the production. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Good, but that's great. Uh, but then the uh, natural question that comes next is if this game is done, are you working on something new? Uh, for... yes, 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 of course. Yes, uh, we have um, a couple of games uh, that we are considering doing next. Uh, we still have to decide which one we'll go uh, with, but uh, we'll definitely move on and uh, create another game, which I hope it will be on Kickstarter in next year this time. So uh, we're not <laughs> we're not uh, sitting still and uh, doing nothing. We're we're making games. And can you tell us a bit about the topic, or give a hint, or it's uh, super uh, secret? I would say that it will be one of uh, less known theaters of World War Two. Okay, a less known theater of World War Two. Still in yeah. Europe, or, or are you having some uh, adventures somewhere else? I think we'll go a little bit uh, farther from Europe. This okay, time. good. But then I'm extremely curious to know more because I think that covering some, uh, yeah, some, some theaters that are outside of Europe is is always uh, super super interesting. Whether it's for World War One or World War Two, I think we need more game on on other theaters. So yes. I'm, I'm I'm really looking forward to to this. But uh, but thanks uh, Vukashin for for answering all of my questions uh, today. Uh, I wish you good luck for for the campaign, but it looks like it's going really well. So that's uh, so that's really good. Just the last few days, I think, uh, before before the end of the campaign, when this video would be released, I will have added the link in the description. So if people want to have a look and uh, potentially back before it's the end of the campaign, uh, please do so. And uh, well, I hope that you'll be back when the when the game is released. You have a TTS module, and it's about to be sent to the backers. Uh, I would be very happy to have you back on the show to actually record a, a teach and play together if you are if you are up for it. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Fred, for having me and uh, thank you for this great interview. It was a lot of fun uh, talking with you. And of course, uh, once we get the tabletop simulator up, uh, I'll let you know when uh, we can do a playthrough. Excellent. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.